Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the blood supply to the brain. And we're going to be doing that in two parts. The first part, we're going to be looking really at the vertebral basilar system. So this is really the vertebral arteries, both of them, the basilar artery, and the branches that come off of those. The second part of it will be discussing the circle of Willis. But to really talk about those things, we need to understand the sources of all of these arteries. And we're going to go all the way back here to the arch of the aorta. So remember, the aorta comes right off of the left ventricle of the heart. And when we go through the ascending aorta, we then get to this loop called the arch. And there are three major branches that come off of that. So the first one is the brachiocephalic artery. And then we have the left common carotid artery and the left subclavian artery. Remember that the brachiocephalic artery actually diverges into a right common carotid and right subclavian, whereas the left versions of those arteries come directly off of the arch. Okay, So we've got left and right common carotids and then left and right subclavian arteries. All right. Now the common carotid arteries, regardless of whether it's left or right, at some point near the carotid sinus are going to bifurcate into two separate arteries. There's the external carotid artery, which is the topic of another video. That goes outside of the cranium and serves structures superficial to the skull. Whereas the other bifurcation, the internal carotid artery, goes into the cranium and will eventually uh, produce parts of the circle of Willis up here. We're going to come back to the internal carotid artery, but just remember that both common carotid arteries bifurcate into an external and internal carotid artery. Um, I mention that because I've got the right common carotid here, and for the sake of space I didn't show its bifurcation, but again it's the same thing that we see here on the left side. Now what's also important is the subclavian artery. And again, I don't have it drawn here on the left side, but the same thing happens that would happen on the right. So the subclavian artery will traverse laterally on either side, and eventually it'll actually uh, pass underneath the clavicle over the margin of the first rib, where it actually would become the axillary artery. Okay? But before that ever happens, it gives off several branches, one of which is the vertebral artery. So the vertebral artery here is coming off of the subclavian artery. Again, we also have a vertebral artery coming off of the left subclavian. Again, that's right here. That would actually be coming off of the left subclavian, but just for clarity, I didn't show that. Now, the first branch that comes off the vertebral artery is what's termed the pica. Now, that's an abbreviation common to use in neuro, uh, but really it's the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Not cerebral, cerebellar. Um, and so the structures it's going to supply are going to be the lateral portions of the medulla, portions of the cerebellum, also the choroid plexus um, and the fourth ventricle. And that's the choroid plexus associated with the fourth ventricle. Okay? So these are the structures supplied by the pica. Now you'll also notice here that after the pica branches off of the vertebral artery, uh, it actually gives off a branch itself, and that's the posterior spinal artery. So the posterior spinal artery is going to supply blood to the posterior one-third of the spinal cord. And that comes off of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Now further up the vertebral artery, we have coming off a branch called the anterior spinal artery. This artery, as you would guess based on this one, would supply the anterior two-thirds of the spinal cord. These branches over here on the right vertebral artery are also coming off of the left vertebral artery, but again, I didn't put those for the sake of space. Now those vertebral arteries, we talked about the pathway of those in a, few, in a previous video, going through the intervertebral foramina of the cervical spine. Eventually, they're going to rise above the atlas C1 and move into the cranium. And at some point, very quickly, once they enter the cranium, they're going to fuse together or converge. And so when the left and right vertebral arteries converge, they're going to form the basilar artery. The basilar artery is one artery. It does not have a left and a right, which makes sense because it's a convergence of the right and left vertebral arteries. So basilar artery does not have a left and a right. It's right in the midline. But it itself has multiple branches. The first one that comes off, again, there's a left and right on this one as well, is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, also called the ICA. The ICA is going to supply blood to the infralateral pons and the anteroinferior cerebellum. Okay. Now as we go up, there's a series of arteries that come off on either side. These are called the pontine arteries. 
Um, and these, of course, supply the pawns. Okay, again, left and right. And then going up further, also left and right, there is the superior cerebellar artery. So really, there's three cerebellar arteries. So the superior cerebellar arteries are really the last true branches of the basilar artery before it terminates and bifurcates into the posterior cerebral arteries. We'll cover that in just a second, okay? Now, the superior cerebellar artery supplies the superior cerebellum and parts of the midbrain. Now, it's also worth mentioning that the basilar artery itself has branches directly that come off, and those also supply the midbrain. So the midbrain is really supplied directly by the basilar artery, but also by the superior cerebellar artery, all right? Now, as you can see here, the basilar artery eventually is just going to terminate. And the way that it terminates is by forming the left and right posterior cerebral arteries. Okay? The posterior cerebral arteries are the first components of what we call the circle of Willis. So the circle of Willis is really all of this, and here's the specific components that actually make up the circle. We'll come back to this at the very end, but let's first get the anatomy. So the basilar artery terminates by bifurcating into the posterior cerebral arteries. And those posterior cerebral arteries really uh, supply the occipital lobe of the brain. And so if you have, let's say, a stroke of the posterior cerebral artery, what you might expect to have is some kind of blindness or partial blindness. The specific type of blindness you see is normally hemilateral hemianopsia, but we'll be covering that in a separate video. And then the posterior cerebral arteries, before they traverse to the occipital lobe, uh, before they get too far, they give off another branch called posterior communicating arteries. Uh, each posterior cerebral artery gives off one of these. And so this posterior communicating artery is going to head toward uh, this junction between the internal carotid artery and the anterior cerebral artery. So before we get into that, it's a little bit confusing up here. Let's go back and talk about that internal carotid artery. I said we'd come back to it. Remember the internal carotid artery is a branch of the common carotid artery. So there's an internal carotid artery on each side, although I only have one shown here. So the internal carotid artery really traverses up the neck. It doesn't give off any branches in the neck. The internal carotid artery really is just going up to the brain. And that's its major function, is to supply blood to the cerebrum. So it doesn't give off neck branches. It travels up here, enters into the cranium, and you can follow its path here. And really, the internal carotid artery kind of terminates right there where my mouse is. So what you see is there's really a junction between three arteries. We have the posterior communicating artery. We have the internal carotid artery, and then the anterior cerebral artery that comes off of that. Okay, so right here, that internal carotid artery really sort of becomes, or branches off to become, the middle cerebral artery. Okay, so right here is that four-way stop, so to speak. So here the internal carotid artery branches to become the middle cerebral artery. Now the middle cerebral artery supplies the lateral cortices and the temporal and insular lobes. The middle cerebral artery is really the most common artery to have a stroke in, in the circle of Willis. And if you have a stroke in the middle cerebral artery, those symptoms normally are going to manifest as issues uh, in the face and the upper extremities. So if there's a stroke there, there'll be issues mainly in the upper extremities um, and the face. So that internal carotid artery gives off that middle cerebral artery. But you can see here that the internal carotid artery is going to sort of merge with that posterior communicating artery. And in addition to giving off the middle cerebral artery, you'll also see the anterior cerebral artery come off of that. So here's your anterior cerebral artery. Now here's some more confusing stuff, right? Where I'm tracing my mouse is the anterior cerebral artery. Starts here, comes up, and then up here is also anterior cerebral artery. So the way I think about them is they kind of have these antennas up here, okay? So all this is anterior cerebral artery. Now the anterior cerebral arteries supply really the medial part of the frontal lobe and the superior medial parts of the parietal lobes. And when you have an issue with the anterior cerebral artery, uh, the symptoms are more going to be um, problems with the lower extremity, so the legs and the trunk. So a stroke of the anterior cerebral artery will impair the legs, it'll impair the uh, pelvic girdle muscles, and then also a lot of the trunk. So here is one anterior cerebral artery. This is the other anterior cerebral artery. 
This little artery right here connecting the two anterior cerebral arteries, this is the anterior communicating artery. And so when we look up the structures that make up the circle, we have the posterior cerebral artery, the posterior communicating artery, this little piece right here of the internal carotid artery, and technically this arrow for the middle one should be pointed out here. This right here is still internal carotid artery, so that makes up part of it. Then we have the anterior cerebral artery and the anterior communicating artery. This could be a common anatomy question. Does the middle cerebral artery make up the circle of Willis? No, if you actually look up the true boundaries of the circle of Willis, it does not include the middle cerebral artery because the middle cerebral artery is really a branch that comes off. So right there where my mouse is, again, uh, that's really where the internal carotid artery terminates and then becomes the middle cerebral artery as it branches off, the other branch being the anterior cerebral artery. Okay, So notice that middle cerebral artery is not actually a component of the circle of Willis. It comes off of it. All right, But again, the anterior cerebral artery right here and the posterior cerebral artery also have branches that come off. It's just that components of them make up the circle. And this circle of Willis is often called the circulus arteriosus. But really what the circle of Willis is, is it's one giant anastomosis. Remember what an anastomosis is. It's a network of blood vessels that allows multiple passageways, so that way, if there's a blockage somewhere, blood can still get elsewhere. And so if you have an occlusion somewhere, uh, you can still get blood flow elsewhere uh, that can contribute and minimize the destructive effects of the stroke. Um, if you did not have an anastomosis here, uh, the problems you would see with a stroke would be much more severe. You'd see a much higher fatality rate. Okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the circle of Willis and also the blood supply to the brain stem. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.